Now, the trial of the NHS nurse Lucy Letby is continuing at Manchester Crown Court. She wept as she told the court that she was devastated at being accused of murdering seven young babies and the attempted murder of ten others. Asked by her defence lawyer if she'd done anything wrong, no, she replied. She told the jury that she'd only ever done her best to care for the babies. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven newborns and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. The jury has now been sitting for eight months. Prosecutors have finished outlining their case and the court has begun hearing from the defence on why they say Lucy Letby is not guilty of the 22 charges that she faces. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. So prosecutor Nick Johnson Casey continued his cross-examination of Lucy Letby. He's now focusing on the specific allegations relating to each baby in the case. Regular listeners will know that the babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons and the identities of their families are also being protected. So we're calling them Babies A to Q. This podcast will go further than the headlines and news reports, but at times you might wonder why we aren't bringing you more details. That's because we can only tell you what the jury have heard, and that's to preserve the integrity of a fair trial. Seven of the babies died, ten survived. Every one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter, and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. In this episode, we'll hear that Lucy Letby allegedly cooked or faked medical notes and charts to shift the blame onto colleagues and to cover her tracks. She allegedly attacked babies when their parents reluctantly left their cot sides. We'll hear her claim the neonatal unit was dirty, with raw sewage in sinks. And that the incompetence of doctors may have been a factor in some of the babies' deaths. Welcome to episode 36, False Trails. Right, Liz, so it was another busy few days in court with Lucy Letby facing more questions from the prosecutor. Yes, in last week's episode, we heard a lot from prosecutor Nick Johnson Casey, who started his cross-examination of Lucy Letby. Now he's concentrating his questions on three girls and a boy, baby E, baby G, baby H and baby I. So he began with baby E and just to remind you, he was an identical twin boy who Lucy Letby is accused of murdering by injecting him with air on a night shift in August 2015. She is also accused of trying to poison his brother, Baby F, with insulin the following shift. Mr Johnson explained that he'll come to Baby F and the insulin allegations later this week, but he started by asking Lucy Letby what her case was in relation to Baby E. He asked her whether she thought staffing issues or medical incompetency contributed to Baby E's death. Yes, and she said it was not her case that problems with staff were to blame, but she did say it was possible that medical incompetency could have had an effect on baby E's care. And she described how the unit had plumbing problems and raw sewage would often spill out of the sinks in Nursery 1 onto the floor, meaning staff couldn't wash their hands properly. She said this was potentially an unsafe environment, although she admitted she didn't think it had anything to do with baby E's death. More specifically, she said she thought mistakes by doctors could have contributed to his death and suggested they should have given Baby E a blood transfusion sooner. Now, you might remember that when Baby E began to deteriorate on the night shift of August 3rd, 2015, he started to bleed profusely and lost a quarter of all the blood in his body. Dr David Harkness, the registrar on duty, told the court he'd never seen such a huge bleed in a baby of that size. So Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby about this. 
Is it your case that medical incompetency contributed to his collapse or death? Possibly, yes. Whose medical incompetencies? The medical team who were on that night. I just think collectively they could have acted sooner to respond to the blood issue. Reacted sooner? Or treated. But their reaction would depend on when you told them there was an issue, wouldn't it? Yes. And our understanding is that you didn't tell them as soon as Baby E did start to bleed? Yes. You understand the prosecution's case is that Baby E's mother is telling the truth and her son was bleeding at 9pm, but you didn't tell anyone about that until at least an hour later? No, I don't agree with that. I think once Baby E was profusely bleeding after 10pm, maybe a blood transfusion or something could have been given sooner. I don't know if that would have made a difference to him. And it's worth just pointing out, Liz, that the prosecution say Baby E's mother went to visit her sons in Nursery One that night to deliver some breast milk for their 9pm feed. She said as she approached Nursery One where Lucy Letby was looking after both of her twins, she heard Baby E screaming and she saw blood around his mouth and his chin. She said Lucy Letby told her that the blood had been caused by his breathing tube irritating his throat and was nothing to worry about and she should go back to the maternity ward upstairs. And Baby E's mum was one of the parents who gave evidence in person. Here's a recap of what she told the jury when questioned about it by Mr Johnson back in episode 7. I could hear my son crying and it was like nothing I had heard before. I walked over to the incubator to see blood coming out of his mouth and I panicked. I was panicking because I felt like there was something wrong. Was Lucy Letby near your son when you walked in? No, there was a workstation and she was at the workstation. Just describe what you could hear. I could hear crying. What sort of crying? It was a sound that should not have come from a tiny baby. It was horrendous. It was more of a scream than a cry. I asked why he was bleeding and what was wrong. Did she give you a response? What did she say? She said the feeding tube from the back of his throat would be rubbing and that would have caused the blood. Did you accept that explanation? Yes. Were you concerned about that explanation? Yes. Did Lucy Letby say anything else to you? She told me to go back to the ward. It's the prosecution case that Baby E's mum was right to be worried. Mr Johnson said Lucy Letby had injured him moments before by shoving a hard plastic tube or piece of medical equipment, such as a wire that's used to help open an airway, down his throat, causing him to start bleeding. He suggested to her that she didn't alert anyone to this bleeding for another hour and falsified records to make it seem like it hadn't started until 10pm. But Lucy Letby denied this. She insisted Baby E did not have any blood around his mouth until after 10pm and she didn't recall Baby E's mum coming to the nursery before that. I'm suggesting to you that when Baby E's mother came down at 9pm, you had inflicted an injury on him to cause bleeding. No, I don't accept that. That didn't happen. That's why she described he was screaming, wasn't it? No. Did you tell Baby E's mother that the source of the bleed was the insertion of a nasogastric tube? No. That is what you told Baby E's mother when she queried why her son had blood around his mouth. No, I don't recall that. I don't believe I would have said something like that. She also denied asking one of her colleagues, Nurse Belinda Williamson, to do Baby E's observations at 10pm, so that it was her signature on the nursing charts at the time of his collapse. That's what you do. Get other people to write things on the charts to cover up for what you were doing. No. That's not correct. Mr Johnson asked her about a rash seen by Dr Hartness during Baby E's resuscitation, which he described as strange purple patches on his tummy. He said it looked like a rash he'd also seen on Baby A before his death. The prosecution said this was caused by an air embolus or bubble blocking blood flow to his heart. But Lucy let me disagree that the rash was patchy or the same as the one seen on Baby A. Instead, she said it was more like a purple band across his abdomen. It was different to that scene on Baby A, she said, because he was more pale and mottled. She also denied taking the opportunity to inject air into Baby E when the consultant on duty was checking x-rays on a computer that was behind a partition wall, blocking her view. You killed Baby E, didn't you? No. And you injected him with air? No. 
just as you'd done with other babies before. No. And Mr Johnson suggested that in the aftermath of baby E's death, Lucy Letby was obsessed with his mother. He reminded the court that she searched for her on Facebook nine times, including late at night on Christmas Day, four months later. Can you tell us why you were searching for her continually? Because I often thought about baby E and baby F. You search for their mother nine times and their father once from August to December and twice in January as well. To see how baby F was doing. The first of those searches was on August the 6th at 7.58pm. Where was baby F on August the 6th? On the neonatal unit. Why were you searching for baby F's mum on August the 6th? Because he was on my mind and when I think of people, I often search for them. You were looking for what reaction you'd got from this grieving family, weren't you? No. Just as you were on Christmas Day of all days? No. Didn't you have better things to do at 23.26pm on Christmas Day than search for Baby E's mum? No. I often thought of Baby E and Baby F. Because you'd killed one and tried to kill the other? No, I didn't. I thought that myself and baby E's mother had a good relationship. So Mr Johnson turned his attention then to baby G. You'll remember she's the most premature baby in the case. She was a baby girl born at just 23 weeks in a hospital toilet. Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder her three times on two significant milestones in her life, her 100th day and her due date. She allegedly overfed her with milk and injected her with air, once on September the 7th and twice a fortnight later on September the 21st. This caused her to collapse and stop breathing. The attacks, the prosecution say, have left her with severe brain damage and unable to walk, talk or feed herself. And her life expectancy is unknown. Lucy Letby told the jury Baby G's collapses on these milestones were just coincidence. She said that even though Baby G was 10 weeks old by the time she arrived at the Countess, she'd been born on the margins of viability and still had additional ongoing health issues because of her extreme prematurity. But Mr Johnson accused her of exaggerating Baby G's problems and deflecting his questions because she was unable to say exactly what problems she had. He said that by September the 7th, Baby G had no feeding issues at all. She was being looked after in nursery four and all signs were good until her projectile vomit, which he said she had caused. Hers is another case where she'd cooked or falsified medical notes to try and shift blame and cover her tracks, Mr Johnson said. He reminded the jury that the first attack, in the early hours of September the 7th, took place while the nurse who was looking after baby G, this is Lucy Letby's best friend who can't be named for legal reasons, was on a break. She'd already fed baby G 45 mils of milk at around 2am before leaving the unit and sometime later, the prosecution say, Lucy Letby forced more milk and air down her nasal feeding tube, causing her to collapse. Mr Johnson showed the jury a nursing note written by Lucy Letby in which she described how she and colleague Ailsa Simpson had been sitting at the nursing station when they heard a loud retching noise from inside nursery four at 2.15am. They found baby G vomiting violently from her nose and mouth, the note said. But Mr Johnson said other notes made by Dr Alison Ventress, the registrar who was crash called to help, indicated the collapse actually took place closer to 2.30am, some 15 minutes later. I'm going to suggest to you that you deliberately misstated the time that baby G had this event and it happened much closer to 2.30am. No, I don't agree. You have deliberately put the time of the event forward to 2.15am. No, I disagree. The reason you've done this is so there is a more obvious link to your best friend feeding the child and the event because you wanted to create the impression that the two events were linked, whereas in fact the reason baby G collapsed is that you deliberately overfed her. That's not true. You did it by putting milk into a syringe and using a plunger to force air and milk into her. No, that's not true. 
Lucy Letby said it was possible that her friend had mistakenly overfed baby G at 2am, but later conceded it was not a realistic possibility. She claimed the air later drawn out of her tummy came from the oxygen given via a mass to help to revive her. Mr Johnson said that 45 minutes later, Dr Ventress was called back to baby G because she collapsed again. When she went to put a breathing tube down her mouth, she saw blood-stained fluids coming from her windpipe and vocal cords. So echoes of baby C and baby E, would you agree with that? I don't recall her saying it had come up through the cords. It had come up from somewhere down there? Yes. When you'd been alone with baby G? I'm not saying I've been alone with baby G. You'd inserted something into her airway, hadn't you? No. You caused bleeding, as you have done with many of those other children. No, that's not true. Later that night, after she'd finished her shift, Lucy let me return to the hospital. She told the jury she went back to sign some documentation, but Mr Johnson said she had a more sinister motive. You went to visit baby G, didn't you? Were you looking for an opportunity to finish her off? No. A fortnight later, on September the 21st, the date baby G would have been born if she hadn't come early, Lucy Letby allegedly attacked her twice more. Again, she's accused of injecting her with air and overfeeding her with milk at 9.15am and then sabotaging her care six hours later at around 3.30pm. Mr Johnson suggested that after baby G vomited and collapsed, Lucy Letby went back and altered her observation chart to make it look like the baby's temperature had been falling in the hours before. Did you go back after the event and cook the chart to make it look like baby G was declining before she vomited? No, she had a low temperature before the start of the shift. I'm suggesting that you have altered those charts to make the position look like baby G is declining. I've not misdocumented anything. She also denied taking an opportunity to sabotage baby G later that day when she was left behind a privacy screen by doctors who'd been fitting her with a new cannula. Mr Johnson said Lucy Letby was in the nursery with her other babies and once they'd finished the procedure, the doctors told her to put baby G back in the cot. But she insisted that was not right and she did not recall being told this at any time. You took advantage of a situation and sabotaged baby G. No, I disagree. Next, Mr Johnson asked about baby H. She was the baby girl born six weeks premature because her mother was diabetic. She'd breathing problems after birth and was eventually diagnosed with a punctured lung, which required her to have several chest strains. Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder her twice on consecutive night shifts on September the 26th and September the 27th. She allegedly sabotaged her breathing tube and dislodged her chest drains, causing her to collapse and her heart to stop. She almost died and needed resuscitating for up to 22 minutes, but miraculously survived. Lucy Letby told the jury that shortcomings in baby H's care could have contributed to her problems and collapses. She said she should have had medicine to help her lungs, but it wasn't given immediately after she was born. The Countess also did not have any of the chest drains she needed in stock and they had to be urgently couriered from the nearest specialist centre around 20 miles away. Lucy Letby also claimed doctors in Chester didn't have experience of such drains, that they may not have inserted them correctly because there was often discussion among staff on how to manage them. She said she'd only ever seen drains stitched into patients but baby G's were held in with tape. She said they could potentially have become dislodged, but denied doing that herself. Mr Johnson reminded Lucy Letby about evidence given by Baby H's father. He told jurors he left his daughter to go home to bed shortly before midnight on the evening of September the 25th, only to be woken not long later by a phone call telling him to return to the hospital urgently. It's the prosecution case that his daughter collapsed soon after he left because Lucy Letby pulled out one of the drains in her chest causing her oxygen levels to fall. I'm going to suggest you remove the drain. No. That's the reason why Baby H desaturated just before midnight, just after her father had left. No. You were sabotaging Baby H that night, weren't you? No. 
Mr Johnson pointed to a nursing note written by Lucy Letby which documented baby H's collapse at 11.30pm. He said it contradicted that of the doctor on duty, Dr Ventress, who said she'd been crash bleeped at 11.50pm, a 20-minute discrepancy. He also said she'd made more false entries in the handwritten charts later on that night to give the impression that baby H was deteriorating in the lead-up to another collapse at 3.20am. This time her heart stopped and she needed 22 minutes of CPR and adrenaline to bring her back to life. By the end of the shift, she'd made a miraculous recovery. These were yet other examples of her cooking the records, Mr Johnson said. So having been on the brink of a fatal collapse about three or four hours earlier, she had made a miraculous recovery. Yes. Were you pleased? Of course I was pleased. Or were you frustrated that your attempt to kill her had failed? No. Mr Johnson then asked Lucy Letby about the following night when she wasn't Baby H's designated nurse. She was caring for two other children in nursery too, while Shelley Tomlins was looking after Baby H. He showed the jury a text she'd sent in which she'd said she was helping Nurse Tomlins in Nursery One. I've been helping Shelley, so Lee's still involved. What were you referring to? Helping Shelley. With who? With Baby H. So at least still involved, what did you mean? I'd had Baby H for the previous three nights, so knew her well. So this is me saying I was still involved in her care, but didn't have responsibility for her. If anything went wrong, it was not going to come back on you, was it? No. Was that your opportunity to sabotage Baby H because you were not connected to her on the paperwork? No. Mr Johnson said Baby H had two profound drops in oxygen that night, at half past eight and then just before ten past eleven. Following both, he said, it was noted that she had blood-stained fluid that had come up from her lungs and into her breathing tube and her mouth. Like Baby E, isn't it? I cannot comment on that. That's what you saw with Baby E, isn't it? Blood in the mouth, a vomit of blood. That's different to finding blood-stained secretions. You'd been interfering with Baby H's tube, hadn't you? That's why she was desaturating. No. Mr Johnson also suggested that she was bored on the shift. He pointed out that nine minutes before Baby H suffered her most serious collapse, at just before 1am, she'd been scrolling on Facebook, liking the posts of strangers and photographs of a friend. Did you have time on your hands? No. Were you a bit bored at 12.45 that morning? I can't say. I may have been on my break. Again, he said Baby H's father, who was staying in the parents' room at the hospital, had left his daughter's side to get some sleep shortly before her heart stopped and she needed CPR for the second night in a row. Mr Johnson said this was a theme in the case. Babies being murdered or harmed by Lucy Letby when their parents were away from their cots. These children, including Baby H, were attacked when their mums and dads had left to get some sleep, to get some food or to pick up their other children from school, he said. So Lucy Letby, again with Baby H, we have a second incident happening just after the parent had left. Yes. Baby H's father leaving gave you the opportunity to sabotage Baby H, didn't it? No. Just as in the cases of Baby B, Baby C. Baby D, Baby I, Baby M, Baby N and Babies O and P. All children who deteriorated shortly after their parents left. Is that something you identified as an opportunity to attack children? No, I've never attacked any child. Mr Johnson reminded Lucy Letby of the evidence of Dr Matthew Neem, who was crash called to help that night. He said he remembered Lucy Letby being in the room when he arrived and was concerned because he wasn't clear why baby H had collapsed. But she told jurors she couldn't recall if she was there or what she was doing when. Mr Johnson said the nursing notes showed Lucy Letby had made an entry on the medical charts for another baby not involved in the case at the time baby H collapsed. That was to give yourself an alibi, wasn't it? For your interference with baby H? No, that's me giving care to the baby I was allotted. He also asked if she remembered Baby H needing oxygen via a mask at 3.30am when her oxygen levels dropped again. 
He also reminded her of Nurse Tomlin's note, which described her as having copious amounts of secretions that were pink-tinged. Had you interfered with Baby H's endotracheal tube again? No. There you were, back again in Nursery One again, weren't you? Just after this incident which Nurse Tomlins records at 3.30am. Yes, I'm helping Shelley after that, yes. Why is it always you who ends up in Nursery One when something happens? I don't agree, it's always me. You tried to kill Baby H twice, didn't you? No. So in the final session, Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby about Baby I. She was very premature, having been born at 27 weeks when her mother's waters broke early. Lucy Letby is accused of attacking her three times before allegedly murdering her on the fourth attempt when she was around 11 weeks old on October the 23rd. Now you might remember that nurses at the Countess knew Baby I well because although she'd also spent time at the more specialist hospitals in the region, They'd cared for her on and off for much of her short life. And a feature of baby eye was that her tummy was often swollen or distended. Lucy Letby told jurors that this was a topic of conversation among staff at the Countess because they wondered whether she was getting the treatment she needed. She denied Mr Johnson's suggestion that she'd used this problem as an opportunity, but he said it was the prosecution's case that she'd injected air into baby eye's feeding tube, causing her tummy to bloat and to crush her lungs. Lucy Letby said she didn't remember a great deal about two collapses suffered by Baby I on September the 30th, one at around half past four in the afternoon and another at half past seven in the evening. But Mr Johnson highlighted this date as being significant because by this time doctors were so confident that she was progressing well that they'd recommended she be given her first set of vaccinations a few days later. This, he said, also mirrored the case of Baby G, who was also earmarked for her immunisations after Lucy Letby allegedly attacked her. So by September the 30th, Mr Johnson said, Lucy Letby had cared for baby I many times and she knew the routine of her mother well. She denied this, but he insisted she knew baby I's mum left the hospital in the afternoon to pick up the other children from school. And while she was away on the school run at around 4pm, He said Lucy Letby pumped excessive amounts of milk or air into her while giving her a routine milk feed via her nasal tube to try to kill her. You had pumped her with air or milk, hadn't you? No. Were you excited by what you did? I fed baby I a normal tube feed. Mr Johnson then reminded the jury about the second alleged attack on baby I, which took place around a fortnight later on a night shift in the early hours of October the 13th. And just to recap, it was Nurse Ashley Hudson looking after Baby Eye on this shift. She told the court that she had asked either Lucy Letby or Nurse Caroline Oakley to keep an eye on Baby Eye because she was nipping away to help another colleague. She told the jury that the main light was off in Nursery 2 and Baby Eye's cot had a canopy over it, keeping her face in shadow. But when she returned about a quarter of an hour later, Lucy Letby was already in the doorway and she told her that the baby looked pale. Nurse Hudson gave evidence in person and she became tearful when she was asked questions about the event, which happened around three o'clock in the morning. And it's worth reminding you of what she said. I looked towards baby eye. I could see she was in the cot, but I couldn't see the top half of her because she was obscured by the lighting and the canopy. So I turned around and switched the main light on the nursery. I pushed back the canopy and pulled back the blankets to have a proper look at her and assess her. That's when I recognised she was in quite a poor condition. She was incredibly pale in colour, almost white. She didn't respond to me. She was very still. She was floppy and she was making gasping, breathing movements a handful of times within a minute. My first thought and worry was that she had deteriorated so rapidly that it was too late. The change in her had been remarkable. So Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby about this event and she claimed Nurse Hudson was inexperienced and should have had baby eye on a monitor or noticed changes in her condition sooner. But she agreed it was not her case that any incompetence or any mistakes made by staff contributed to baby eye's collapse on this occasion. 
She also accepted that less than two hours before her collapse, baby I had taken a full bottle feed, was breathing for herself and had been demanding milk, which were all good signs. Lucy Letby said she had no memory of being asked to look after baby I while Nurse Hudson went to help the colleague. She also disputed that she was already standing by the door when Nurse Hudson returned and instead insisted that they'd arrived at Nursery 2 together. She also said the lights were not turned off in the room and instead she thought they were on low on a dimmer. There's always enough light in the unit to illuminate the nursery, she said. How long after arriving did you notice that baby I looked pale? I can't put it into time, but it was very quick. How did you get physically to the doorway of nursery too? I could have come from the corridor. Are the lights on in the corridor? Yes. What is the effect if you go from a bright corridor into a dim nursery? What does it do to your eyesight? I don't know. You really don't know? You're a nurse. Everybody knows, don't they? If you go from bright into dark light, what effect does it have on your ability to see in the dark? It depends on the brightness, but you wouldn't be able to see as well. You have noticed it straight away. That's because you have caused what you are purporting to notice, isn't it? No. Mr Johnson then showed the jury the photograph reconstruction of Baby Eye's cot, which had a canvas canopy to protect the baby's head from bright lights. He said it showed how the nursery was lit on the night of the alleged attack. But Lucy Letby told the jury the picture was not accurate. The room would be lighter and the cots would be nearer the workbench. How big are the hands of a child of baby eyes age? Small. Tiny, aren't they? Yes. And her head is small as well, isn't it? Yes. She was covered in a baby grow? Yes. There was almost nothing to see, was there? No, just her hands and face. Which would have been covered by that tent-like structure? Not entirely, no. Ashley Hudson was right when she said you couldn't see anything from that doorway? No. Do you remember what you said to the police when they asked you about this? They asked, how could you see baby I was pale? You said what? Maybe I spotted something that Ashley wasn't able to spot. The rooms aren't always dark, so you couldn't see the baby at all. You don't have better eyesight than Ashley, do you? No. You were putting all this down to your greater experience, is that right? No. How were you able to spot it if you were both still in the same place? I had more experience, so I knew what I was looking for, at. What do you mean, looking for? I don't mean it like that. I'm finding it quite hard to concentrate on all these dates at the minute. At this point, Lucy Letby appeared upset and agitated, so the judge halted proceedings for the day around half an hour early, telling jurors it had been a long day for the witness. So that's it for episode 36. The court isn't sitting today because of the bank holiday, but the trial is due to resume tomorrow when Mr Johnson will continue his cross-examination of Lucy Letby, focusing on baby's I to Q. And that's likely to take most of this week. I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow me on Twitter at Liz Hull. You can give us a rating and you can share the podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or follow me at Radio Caroline or send us an email at the trial of Lucy Letby at gmail.com. See you then. <laughs>